Hi, thanks for joining me to um, talk about a couple of my favorite subjects, beavers, beaver habitat, and beaver-mediated streams and wetlands. Beaver restoration, in particular BDAs, are a hot topic these days, and I would guess many of you are eager to see details of how they're built and where we put them and what the process looks like. This is us last summer, building a, one of a series of BDAs at 12 Mile Ranch in Park County. There were a lot of helping hands on this project, including landowners, land trust, um, wildlife experts, uh, wetland experts, stream nerds. Um, with many helping hands working together, we implemented over 50 BDAs along nearly 600 meters of valley length. This site was selected because it has high potential for beaver restoration. It is in the appropriate geological setting, has sufficient water flow, established woody riparian vegetation, ample valley bottom space without land use conflict, and also, quite importantly, neighboring beaver populations. This is a before, during, and after photo set of different treatments on that same project. Uh, Pre-treatment at the top, you can see the stream is mildly incised as a narrow flow path. The veg condition in the foreground is a clue to the extent and condition of the associated riparian wetland, which is limited to the channel and occasional low benches. After treatment, the system is more hydrologically connected with a wider wetted perimeter and varied flow conditions and aquatic habitats. We do this work at base flow, which provides enough water to see the effects of our work, but not make it hard to actually implement the treatments. So let's see how it looks at high water. Pretty cool, right? Uh, look how much this relatively small structure, how much work it's doing on the landscape. It's promoting overland flow and multiple flow paths, creating a diversity of habitats, encouraging deposition and scour, hydrating riparian vegetation, and that's just to name a few effects. Um, the series of BDAs are working together, just like real beaver dams do. So can we say these structures have successfully restored a stage zero beaver stream? Let's take a wider view and see. Aerial view of the post-treatment site. Uh, we can see a group of BDAs here at the center of the screen, and it looks pretty good. Um, but it is definitely not a stage zero beaver system. This does not look like or function like a beaver complex. But these treatments have added structure to an otherwise simplified stream channel. Let's zoom out a little farther. So there you can see our stream project in red there, and, um, and we can compare it to the neighboring systems where beavers are living and working, and we can, um, and these are the systems we're trying to mimic and enable. I like this overview because it's telling because it contrasts the scale of our work with intact beaver systems. The green triangles are active beaver lodges, and that's important because with beavers in neighboring streams and um, without any um, impediments in the movement corridor between the stream and our project site, there is a high likelihood that beavers will move into this project. The blue polygons highlight beaver ponds, and as you can see up in these areas where beavers are active, the pond area is extensive. So let's compare metrics, what we build versus what beavers build. The BDA shown earlier is, a 10 foot, is about 10 feet wide. It creates a pond area of around 200 square feet and has a max depth of about 3 feet. The beaver systems we're trying to mimic have valley-wide beaver dams. They're 100 to 200 feet wide, maybe more, and can have a um, depth of four to six feet. So while our efforts pale in comparison to actual beaver systems, we still feel optimistic about our project, and we think it's a good example of partnering with beavers because there's a chance beavers can move into this project area. Let's take a look at these two photo points from the ground. One and two. Sometimes it can be hard to describe all the features of beaver mediated wetlands and riverscapes. Um, pictures just do a better job of communicating the scale and the complexity of these systems. Um, as anyone who's walked around in these systems know, it, it's challenging and there's a high, high um, habitat diversity. The simple takeaway is that beavers create and maintain these riverscapes better than us. Even just considering the aspects we can easily observe, uh, wetted perimeter, pond depth, pond permanence, habitat variability, beavers consistently outperform our best efforts. And this isn't even considering all those hard to see natural processes that we know that are happening 
they're just difficult to quantify. So the long-term reality of BDAs or other beaver mimicry techniques is that it's a lot of work for people. They require ongoing input from us. So if we're looking for an approach that can be scaled up so restoration efforts can match the many miles of impaired streams and lost wetland acreage, mimicry alone cannot meet this challenge. Being outside and implementing this work is fun and rewarding, but it's also hard and time intensive. So this is the big takeaway. Beaver restoration requires beavers. And if we want to partner with beavers, we better know a little bit about them at the landscape scale and use this information to target our partnership efforts. There are many resources for beaver restoration evaluation. Um, and I want to recognize and acknowledge all the hard work from many sources. There are public, public publications from agencies, um, watershed groups, academia, and they're all excellent resources. After learning with and from many of these folks, um, this is the evaluation framework that we've developed and, and find valuable. To evaluate the feasibility of restoring beaver and beaver habitat to proposed sites, one needs to assess the basic factors needed to support sustainable beaver populations. These include geological context, flow regime, riparian vegetation, physical habitat suitability, metapopulation connectivity, and the potential for conflicts between beaver and people. These factors should all sound familiar. Um, we've heard about them before. What we're going to do, what we're trying to answer is the basic question of what do beavers need to succeed over time and how can we support them? So let's go through each of these. Geological context. As we've learned, Beaver complexes are most common in wide, low gradient alluvial valleys. Dr. Ellen Wool describes the pattern of these types of valleys and watersheds as beads on a string. The important part for restoration is that we are selecting bead sites. It is these naturally depositional portions of the watershed where beavers can have the most influence on the riverscape and have the greatest chance of persisting. This is an oblique view from Google Earth contrasting a bead the large green polygon, polygon with a string, the confined reach. This is a familiar pattern to many of us in the stream restoration community. The extent of riparian wetlands and steep canyon sections, the strings, is minimal compared to the exp expanse of wetlands in open valleys, the beads. In Park County, Colorado, we see a slightly different pattern with long stretches of the unconfined valleys, ribbons, we call these. While the pattern of appropriate geological setting for beaver restoration varies between region, the take home is that beavers persist the longest and create the most expansive wetland systems in the wide, flat alluvial valleys. Let's consider a flow regime. Beavers are notoriously clumsy and vulnerable on land, so they live primarily in water and modify their surroundings to maximize aquatic habitat. To do this, beavers need perennial water source. Considering this first photo, the geological setting may be appropriate, but there's no water, so this won't do. How about this one? Now there isn't much water, but is it enough? I'm going to say yes, and I, I feel confident saying that because beavers can do amazing things in tiny waterways. Also, we can see evidence of past beaver activity. There's cut aspen, a breached beaver dam. Beavers are most common on first to third order streams where water is present year round, but streams are small enough that they're less likely to be overwhelmed by stream power. Um, the South Fork of the South Platte here is probably too powerful for channel spanning beaver dams to persist. Depending on the climate, beavers live in these larger waterways, but they don't build those channel spanning dams. We're focused on systems where they do build those types of dams because of where we work in the headwaters and also because it is these systems where beavers create the complex wetland systems. Vegetation suitability. As you've probably learned, beavers use woody riparian vegetation as a food source and building materials. The vegetation of most riparian areas was altered during the course of settlement. Um, in fact, it's this clearing was so ubiquitous, ubiquitous that it was this in part that led us down the rabbit hole of thinking mountain meadow streams were these single threads with herbaceous dominated floodplains. It's been hard to transition to reimagine riverscapes, but we're doing it. And the good news is that reestablishing riparian vegetation is possible in many places, but it can also take time. 
So it's important for us to have realistic expectations of both response time for the vegetation to get reestablished and then what for whatever period of time it takes for the beaver to return to that area. The Beaver Restoration Assessment Tool, BRAT, was developed by Utah State, and it's a model that incorporates these first three factors that we've covered, geological context, flow regime, and vegetation suitability. The output of this model is an estimate of occupancy represented by the numbers of dams per kilometer, with red being the low end, no beaver dams, and blue being the high end with 15 to 40 dams per kilometer. It's a useful tool to gather preliminary information on site suitability for beavers over large areas. This is the output of BRAT for Park County, Colorado. Now we're lucky in Park County because Colorado Natural Heritage Program Sarah Marshall worked with Julie Scamardo and Julie ran BRAT for all of Colorado as a student with Dr. Ellen Wool at CSU. So Julie and Sarah worked together to fine tune this model, comparing the results with different vegetation data inputs and overlapping BRAT estimates with NWI mapped beaver wetlands. Um, the next step of this work in Park County is to compare the density estimates to on the ground field surveys. So we spent last fall stumbling through beaver complexes all over Park County. It was a really fun project and I would love to tell you more about it, but that's a different presentation. Looking at the map of Park County, we can see the larger order streams are red. This is largely because of the influence of flow regime that we talked about. The uppermost streams are also red or orange, and this is largely due to geological context. These are steep valleys. So we can glean some basic patterns at this scale, but in order to select restoration sites, we need to get into more specifics at a finer scale. We've included physical habitat needs because not only do beavers need the right valley flow and veg, but the persistence of certain, or the presence of certain physical habitats like ponds, dams, canals, lodges, can be informative on several levels. Evidence of past beaver occupancy makes a strong case for future occupancy. Uh, luckily, beavers modify their surroundings and usually remnants of physical habitats that they create are discernible on the landscape. Beavers are also commonly observed reoccupying ponds and lodges because both offer, offer ready-made cover for dispersing beavers or relocating families. In fact, our efforts to mimic beaver dams, building BDAs, are precisely targeting this physical habitat need. BDAs create areas of deeper pool area in the hopes that beavers will find the location desirable and build upon our humble imitation. This is Four Mile Creek study area. As part of the study to compare BRAT output with on-the-ground surveys, we um, digitized pond area using Google Earth imagery. A site that has a pond but no beavers is an excellent site for beaver restoration, right? Most of the work is already done for us. But it also begs the question, if there are ponds, doesn't there also have to be beavers? We were wondering this too, and this brings us to the population dynamics and metapopulation connectivity factor. We can see these ponds on aerial imagery, but where actually are beavers living? How many are there? How long do they persist in an area? Can beavers move from one sub subwatershed to another? Do ponds persist in the absence of beaver? I know for us personally, we certainly have more questions than answers when it comes to this factor of the evaluation. I think this is true for many folks working with beavers and beaver systems. There is a bit of a knowledge gap here and more research is needed. To better understand the pattern of beaver presence over time and spatial distribution, we are comparing beaver pond area year to year using Google Earth imagery. But that imagery can only get us so far. We also need to know what's happening on the ground. Here's the same four mile creek study area with our field observations. Um, the squares are dams, circles are caches, and triangles are occupied lodges. We did this survey in the fall when beavers um, activity is concentrated around lodges when they're preparing for the winter. It makes them easier to find. As a starting point, we targeted areas with high beaver occupancy. Once we know where individual populations are located, we can compare their distribution through the county and consider how populations might interact. Beaver populations in Park County are primarily located in the higher watershed. 
Uh, this is likely a result of minimum human presence in these areas. For the most part, these are not agriculturally valuable lands. And while mining impacted many of the drainages, it's quite clear that beavers were able to eke out an existence over time. Even though we don't have specific answers as to how local populations interact with neighboring populations, the basics of metapopulation meta dynamics are that there are source populations and sink populations. And the more interconnected these groups are, the more resilient populations will be over time. So for the restoration evaluation, consider where your beaver, beaver partners will be coming from and what their travel right, routes might be. Is there a neighboring beaver population? What's the condition of the riverscape and the corridor between populations? If there is no natural connection with an existing population, are you ready and willing to keep translocating until a self-sustaining population is reestablished in the, in the new area? We're discussing land use and potential conflict last today, but oftentimes this is the most influencing factor in site selection. Beavers change the landscape in profound ways. If humans have specific management goals for the valley bottom, conflict could arise. We're in an early stage of beaver restoration here in Colorado. There are many skeptics out there, so honest consideration and anticipation of possible conflicts is very important. But we don't want to give up too early. There are um, methods for conflict resolution, so let's also be creative and, um, and, and find ways to coexist. I want to wrap up today with this example of Terriel Creek, which has been one of the most interesting restoration projects for us to watch. Um, the only treatment here was a change in management. Removing grazing allowed all these stunted willows in the top photo to grow. Starting in 2018 and 2019, we began to see signs of beaver, chewed sticks here and there, and then in 2020, the landscape has completely changed. Here's an aerial view. And visually, the change is really impressive. Um, we can also see, we can start, already started to see veg shift that's happening down valley as the hydrology has changed. But let's put some more numbers to it. This is an ex impressive example of the influence of a single, single beaver colony. So one beaver colony moved into this um, site. And here's what we're seeing. The blue shading in the 2017 image is surface water at approximately 12 CFS. And there's 21,000 square meters or 10% of the riparian area is covered. The light blue shading in the 2020 imagery is surface water at approximately 21 CFS. So this is after that beaver dam has moved in. That area is 104,000 square meters or 50% of the riparian area. It's a pretty impressive shift. Now, an important question is what's the long-term forecast for this river, riverscape? Um, a single colony is vulnerable to predation could eliminate the entire population. Luckily, upstream of this project is a state wildlife area with beavers pre present, and downstream is a private ranch with beavers present on it. So it took the beavers some time to recolonize this area, even after the vegetation recovered, but we're hopeful that their presence will persist. We started teaching our kids about streams at a young age, and we would be so happy if they continued. But even if they do continue in the field, we don't want them to still be working on the same streams that we're working on today. There are so many acres of impacted riverscapes. We need to make some progress towards healing them, toward helping these systems become alive again. And that is why we're also teaching our kids about beavers, because beavers can do this better than us. And because beaver restoration requires beavers, we cannot mimic our way out of this. Beaver mimicry can aid in short-term improvements, but the enduring work will be done by the beavers. Thank you.